So welcome everybody to this um, last session in this block before lunch. Um, I'd like you to all welcome um, Tommy Richards to the stage. Um, and, to t and he's going to talk to us about post-mortems, building better software together. Thank you. So you know we're going to talk about postmortems, uh, but I'm going to cheat. I'm going to like switch things around and actually not talk about postmortems for ages, uh, because there's context we have to talk about. We can't talk about postmortems until we talk about how we think about building software, how we think about being an engineer, and what it is that we actually do in our day jobs. So. What mental model do we use when we think about being a programmer, when we think about software and how software works? I want to suggest that the primary model we use is we think of software like it's a complicated machine. We think it has lots of moving parts that sort of cooperate together in order to form a system that does something useful that we want. And the analogy I'm going for here is the internal combustion engine, but it doesn't really matter, but it's, it's a, an okay analogy, so we'll stick with that for now. An engine has lots of parts, and if your car starts making funny noises, unless you're mechanically minded, it's probably not a good idea for you to start ripping it apart to try and figure out what's wrong. Instead, you take it to a mechanic. You take it to someone who has the skill, training, expertise in order to know how that system works. Not only do they know how the system works, but they have enough skill that they can predict the impact of their actions on that system. So they know that when they, I, I'm not a car person, so like I don't actually have it, but you know, when they do this thing over here with the grease and the engine and the motor and you know, <laughs> something useful happens. I, I don't know cars. Uh, but you know, they, they can make that prediction and if they're a good engineer, it usually works out for the best. I think we think the same way as software engineers, right? We think, yeah, it's just software. Sure, it's complicated, but like we're all good engineers. We have the expertise. We know that if we make this change over here, the impact is going to be what we want. But things break all the time. Software is notoriously unreliable. So when things break, it costs us energy. It costs us loss of revenue. It costs us loss of reputation. And we ought to have a good hard think about what it is that's gone wrong so that we can learn something. Because when things break, it's often a great opportunity to, to learn something new about the system that you're working on that you didn't know before. So if we have this mental model going in that a sufficiently skilled practitioner can identify the impact of their changes before they make it, and that cause and effect in the system are sort of reliably determinable, then it's only natural that when something breaks, we sort of look at the outage and we work backwards through the causal chain until we figure out what the root cause was, right? This is root cause analysis. And so we might convene a meeting of all the important people at our company and we might say, right, you know, production went down. Um, let's say that the company that I work for, Zapier, like our front page went down. Zapier.com was, was completely dead. So why did the site go down? Well, the site went down because uh, there was some production code deployed that was trying to access a database column that didn't exist. Ouch, that's not good. Well, why did the database column not exist? Well, the database column didn't exist because the migration that added the database column hadn't been run before the code had been deployed. Yeah, it's not what we want. Why had the migration not been run? Well, the migration hadn't been run because it's a manual process and the engineer responsible for running it didn't run the migration. Let's say it's me, right? I forgot to run the migration. So we've done this root cause analysis. We've sort of narrowed down. We've followed the causal chain until we've gotten to a point where we've identified the problem. I'm a bad engineer. Only there's many problems with that, right? First of all, if cause and effect are determinable for someone with sufficient skill, and we've identified that the root cause is that I didn't do something, or you know, that I should have done, or I did something wrong, then the sort of logical unspoken conclusion is I don't have sufficient skill, right? I'm a bad engineer. And that's gonna make me feel bad. And it's not gonna make me particularly enthusiastic about you know, engaging with engineering in my organization in the future. Second of all, 
if you perform this kind of analysis, you broadcast to the rest of your organization that this is what happens when you make a mistake, right? You better not make a mistake because if you do, your name will be the punchline on an analysis document and no one wants that. And so all of a sudden, people start playing politics, right? No one wants to own up to their mistakes. People will make it look like it was someone else's fault. You know, it's that team over there. They're the ones that caused the problem. It's not us. And finally, when you engage in this sort of reductive root cause analysis, a lot of the times, if you end up at a conclusion that is a technical system, then frequently the fix that you will identify will be really narrow in scope, right? Because you start out with this sort of broad view and you're constantly following those causal chains to a more and more specific fix, at best, you will find something that marginally improves your resiliency, but does not offer the kind of scalable improvement that we want in order to keep our systems working. A slight digression and some audience participation. Raise your hand if you've seen this diagram before and know what it is. Okay, two people, right, for the rest of you. Um, this is the sort of central diagram for a decision-making framework called the Carnarvon Framework. And I wish I had more time because it's really interesting and required reading. You really ought to go and read about it. But the framework exists to help leaders decide how to respond to a problem. And the central insight is that the way you respond to a problem should be determined by the type of system that you're working in. And Carnarvon defines four different domains of systems, and they're categorized by how cause and effect are linked in those systems. And this model that I've just described of the complicated machine exists in the complicated model, where cause and effect are determinable in advance, but perhaps only by people with sufficient skill, right? You and I, unless you're mechanically minded, maybe don't know what's causing your car engine to go weird, uh, but a mechanic does because they have the skill. I want to propose that software engineering, the thing we do when we mash the keys and produce Python code every day, exists in the complex domain. The complex domain contains systems where cause and effect are not determinable in advance. That sentence should scare you, right? I'm saying as engineers, we cannot be 100% sure of the impact of the changes that we're making. Systems in the complex domain include ecosystems, right? Places where the behavior that you want of the system is a property of the connections between conscious agents. A business organization is a great example of a system in the complex domain. This might seem like a bit of a stretch, right? I'm saying like writing code is somehow got something to do with like a sort of network of conscious agents. What the hell? Well, I think there's two reasons why we maybe think this is impractical or, or, or not quite the case. And the first is to do with the way that we think about writing code. We have this idea that in our jobs, we write code. By which I mean, we sit at our desks, you know, we think, we mash the keys, we commit to production, and it's this one-way process, right? Code flows out of your brain into production, and, and then you repeat the cycle. The problem is that before you can write the code, you need to understand the code that you're changing. And in order to do that, you need to build a mental model and sort of mental abstraction, if you will, of the code that you're working on. And in order to do that, you need to read the code. So first of all, we build this abstract mental model. Once we have that, hopefully it's good, right? Hopefully it's accurate enough. We have our model, we have the change we want to make, and we say, ah, I know, with this model, if I change this bit over here, right, if I add this function, change this class, whatever it is, then the impact of my change will be what I want. You know, this bug will be fixed or this new feature will be added. So in a very real sense, we change the code, but the code changes us. Right? The code that you read informs the mental model that you build. And it's not just you. It's you and everyone else that works on that code base. Right? Every function name, every comment, every log message, every error report that you get in Sentry, every metric on your dashboard helps inform your and your colleagues' mental models of the system that you're operating on. 
So you have formed this network of conscious agents, right? You're reacting to your colleagues' changes just as they're reacting to yours. But you're not like communicating in a natural language like English, you're communicating in Python and function names and alert names. The second reason, and the far more sort of prosaic reason why uh, software engineering is in the complex domain is software is built by teams, right? Software hasn't been built by individuals for many, many years. And if we ignore the problems that can come from process, from communication, from team dynamics in our incident analysis, then we ignore an entire class of errors that often produce really serious outages. So if I've convinced you, and I hope I have, uh, that software engineering is in this complex domain, the question arises, how on earth can we operate when cause and effect aren't knowable in advance, right? This sounds crazy. Well, Carnarvon says the way you do this is you follow this loop of probe, sense, respond. Probe meaning you try a thing, right? You form a hypothesis. You say, I think doing X will have this impact. Sense meaning you see if it worked. Did it work? Yes or no? Respond being if it did work, let's do more of that. And if it didn't work, let's do less of that. If this is starting to sound like agile development methodology, you're not wrong. You know, this idea of tight iterations, always trying to build on top of what you've already learned. I mean, we do this already as an industry. This is just a sort of interesting reframing of, of the same problem. So what would an incident analysis look like with this different mental model? Instead of doing root cause analysis. Instead of sort of drilling down and down until we find a single point of failure, we look at the systems that help inform the mental models that people build, right? We assume good intent on the part of our engineering team here. Uh, if any of our engineering team are malicious, that is a, or you know, negligent or undertrained or something like that's a process for, for HR and management. Um, but we ask two questions. We ask, what systems prevented us from sort of probing usefully, right? From executing that probe part of the three steps. In other words, what systems prevented us from running an experiment safely, from treating the changes that we're about to make as an experimental change? And the second question we ask is, what systems prevented us from sensing the impact of that change accurately? What systems provided us with misleading information or missing information? So for that same hypothetical outage as before, we might start coming up with some really interesting insights. We might say, well, the site went down because we deployed some bad code. But, you know, bad code's going to happen. It happens all the time. But the site went down because we deployed the bad code to all of our production servers at once, right? Maybe we need to start having conversations about phase deploys or feature flags or things of this nature. This is a failure of, of us not being able to experiment safely. We might also say, well, there's clearly a, a sort of missing piece of information here. You know, the engineer who uh, pushed this change did not have sufficient signposting to be told that, you know, their uh, change was going to cause a big problem. So maybe we need something in our CI CD pipeline, this sort of thing. So this is all hypothetical, but, you know, we can, uh, it, it, it's very hard to sort of give accurate, uh, useful examples for a hypothetical uh, outage, because the details are what really matters, right? The nuance of the particular situation is, is what's interesting here. So, with that context out of the way, let's talk about running a postmortem. How should I run my own postmortem process? Uh, annoyingly, the answer I'm convinced is, it depends. We can all go to lunch now. Um, <laughs> It depends on the software that you're building. It depends on who your customers are, what price point your customers are paying. It depends on what your company culture is, right? What problems are you trying to solve here? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you about some of the things that we do at Zapier when we're running our postmortems. Uh, and I'm going to try and tell you why we do those things in order to help you understand the context around those decisions so that you can sort of figure out if it's something useful that you maybe also would like to do. 
The first thing that I think is really important is to clearly separate in your minds the concept of incident response from incident analysis. Incident response is, oh my god, production's broken, let's fix it right now. Right? The most important thing is to get your customers back into their happy world of a product that is useful to them and is worth paying money for. Incident analysis, the point is not to figure out what went wrong. The point is to improve your resiliency over time. Make it less likely that things are going to break in the future. It's totally fine if the things that you decide to change as a result of your incident analysis are not connected to the things that broke in the first place. The second thing we do at Zapier, which uh, I want to talk about, is we have trained analysis facilitators. So for a whole bunch of reasons that I'll get into in a second, we believe that having trained individuals run the analysis process is a requirement in order to have a good result out of the uh, postmortem. So the facilitator's job is to keep conversation on track. Right? and make sure that everyone involved has this sort of complex domain frame of mind and understands why we're doing this and what kinds of questions we're interested in answering. Their job is to ask questions that dig at a deeper truth and make sure that as a group we're not satisfied with the sort of surface level ideas that we bring, but that we're really analyzing the, the individual points. Their job is to ensure that everyone in the uh, process has an opportunity to give input and that that input is heard and understood and received. They're there to ensure that we get good participation from all parts of the company and that we're not just analyzing our outages from an engineering perspective or from an SRE perspective, but that we're bringing the whole company together. And finally, they're there to guide people through the process. Right? This can be scary, especially if you haven't done it before. We don't want it to be scary. We want it to be a positive thing that you look forward to being a part of. And so a large part of the facilitator's job is just to you know, calm people down and be that friendly face. So we start our process 24 hours after the outage occurred, roughly. Outage or incident or whatever went wrong. And we do this for a few reasons. First of all, responding to an outage is really hard, right? It can be stressful, it can require that you work late, um, and we want you to have an opportunity to go home to your family, relax, you know, just come to the analysis session with a fresh mind and not be carrying that emotional baggage and that stress into the analysis session. And the second reason why we do this is Zapier is a globally distributed 100% remote company, and so we have to care about time zones. And the time of day when people were at work to respond to a production problem is highly likely to also be the time of the day when they're able to come along to an analysis session. So baking in that 24-hour delay achieves those two goals for us. So at the appointed time, the facilitator will start a video conference call and invite all of the people that we think should be there. Um, and you know, doing this via video conference may seem like a weird thing for a 100% remote company to do. We live and die by our ability to communicate asynchronously, right? We're spread out around the globe. If we can't communicate asynchronously, we can't get anything done. But this is one of those places where I think the benefits of having people in the same room talking face to face at the same time far outweigh the costs. The magic here happens when we have different people from different walks of life building on top of ideas that each other have contributed, and you can't do that asynchronously, at least not within a sensible time frame. So the call starts, the facilitator introduces the process, uh, makes sure that everyone understands what we're doing and why we're doing it. Uh, and this is the first time where the facilitator will refer to something that we call the facilitator's handbook which you can think of it like speaker notes for the postmortem process. And so one of the things that we have in that handbook is example language that you can use to kick off the call. And we found that the specific language that you use can make a huge impact into how people think about the call and the kinds of suggestions that you're likely to get. And you're already really busy as a facilitator, so having to not like, remember to hit those talking points and instead just be able to read out of a, out of a handbook is a huge help. 
So we get everyone settled down and we begin. And we begin by collaboratively editing a document. And the first thing we do is we make an objective record of everything that happened. So we care about things that we did and things that we saw. We put people's names and we put timestamps in UTC because, again, time zones are something we have to care about. Ah, uh, time zones. Uh, <laughs> So as a facilitator here, there's, there's sort of two things that you're making sure to do above and beyond just making sure to capture everyone's uh, suggestions. First of all, you have to make sure that you get input from everyone on the call. So if we've done our job right, we'll have a mix of people with different job titles. And what you'll find is that SRE people tend to talk about pager duty alerts and infrastructure problems. Developers will be talking about GitHub pull requests and production deploys. Support people will be talking about ticket escalations and ticket queues and things like this. So we want to make sure that we capture all of those different perspectives and put them on the timeline. The second thing we care about is that we have cast our mind far back in time enough that we have captured symptoms that maybe at the time weren't apparent that they were leading up to the outage, but with the benefit of hindsight, we can see that, oh yeah, like. That system that's been complaining at us for the last week and we thought was just benign actually wasn't, and it was a big problem. So we always make sure, you know, like we, we think about maybe 24 hours, maybe a week earlier. Are there anything, any other instances that we need to include in this uh, timeline? Once we have that done, we move on to the majority part of the report, which is the systems analysis. And here, this is the hard part for the facilitator. Again, we are very careful to introduce this section with some very careful language where we remind people why we explicitly do not care about root cause analysis. We're not trying to figure out what went wrong. We're trying to figure out what prevented us from experimenting safely, what gave us fundamentally the wrong idea about what the state of the system was in. And so people will be calling out all sorts of things, right? Support people, SREs, developers, they'll all have their opinions. And as a facilitator, you're madly trying to type. You're trying to ask questions that sort of dig at a deeper truth. This is where techniques like the five whys or the infinite hows that you may have heard about can be used. Um, I'm not personally a big fan of them, but you can ask me about that in the hallway. Uh, we have in the facilitator's handbook a list of prompting questions that you can use if you're stuck, right? If you're trying to think about, you know, what haven't we thought about uh, with this particular problem? Um, we're asking everyone to help take notes. It's a very collaborative process. It doesn't really feel like analysis. It feels like brainstorming. This section can take 30 minutes, 40 minutes, an hour, depending on the size and scale of the outage. But there'll come a point where the suggestions start to dry up. And almost always, people now have a sufficient understanding of what happened and what everyone was thinking about and why we took the actions that we did. And it's really, really common that at this point, there are two or three things that really stand out as being sort of partial causes of the outage, right? Two or three systems that failed us in some big way that led us down the wrong path, led us to take the wrong actions, and eventually led us to disaster. And so we capture those, right? We want to fix that stuff. Um, we try and fix things that are low cost to fix and high impact. And you'd be surprised. Like a lot of the times, it's really, really simple stuff. Like the text on an alert is perhaps a bit ambiguous. It's a bit misleading. And in that moment of panic as production is raining down and flaming chunks around you, like you, you don't have time to think. You know, you're being reactive to the problem. And a misleading alert, simple as sim something as simple as the text just maybe not quite being as accurate as it should be, can have a huge consequence if it causes you to then take the wrong decision. So this is kind of the boring part of, of the process because it's you know internal uh, stuff. We, we make sure we have a JIRA ticket. Uh, we make sure it gets prioritized on a team's backlog. We record owners. I'm sure you will do this in your organizations already. The postmortem facilitators follow up on this stuff. 
right? We want to make sure that these things get fixed. Um, and so we, from time to time, will come along and make sure that you know, they are actually getting fixed and we are actually improving going forwards. And this is the end of the call for the participants. It's not the end of the process for the poor facilitators. They have a few more things to do. The first is they post the document that we've built along with a recording of the video conference to the rest of the company. Uh, we have an internal blog. But the important thing here is that, again, time zones, uh, not everyone can attend the analysis session. right? And we need to make sure that we communicate what we talked about and why we decided to change the things that we did, why we picked these action items to the rest of the company. So that's the first piece of administrivia. But the other, and I think possibly the most important thing, is we ask other f facilitators for feedback. So after every session, we'll ask each other, hey, here's a link to the video recording. What could I have done better? Right? How can we improve? Often, the discussion that happens in this feedback is like, well, we think you know, if you'd asked this question at this timestamp in the video, maybe we could have had a discussion down a different line of inquiry that we missed. Sometimes we'll say, ah, yeah, like actually the process that we're following isn't working anymore for us. You know, maybe some other company process has changed, and so we need to react to that. If you forget everything else I've said today, I highly recommend that you remember this, right? However you do your postmortems, however you do your incident analysis, make sure that you sort of bake into the process a way to change the process itself. Because your analysis has to reflect the software that you're building, the culture of your company, the people that you're working with, the size and scale of your company. And if you don't have a way to change it, at best you'll have a process that works for you today and fails for you when, you're, you know, when your company has changed or your software has changed. So keep yourself flexible. Think of it like a sprint retrospective, but for your postmortem process. And now that is the end of the process. And then we get to do it all over again when production breaks next time. So we're very nearly at the end of the talk. Um, I have a slide here where I am, like, I don't feel like I've done anything particularly novel here. There's a few ideas that I've maybe tried to sort of weave together that perhaps haven't been uh, brought together before. But here is a long list of things that I highly recommend you read. If you're interested in um, the Carnarvon framework, there's a bunch of resources here on um, complex systems and somatosy and postmortems and all sorts of things. Um, if you're right now thinking, Tommy, you idiot, like there's no URLs here. How am I going to know where these things are? I got you covered because there's the talk slides. Um, thank you very much. You've been a great audience. I think I have, miraculously, like a couple of minutes for questions. So uh, if anyone has one, hit me up. Are there any questions in the room? Any questions down the... Yeah. Um, you mentioned the... Um the, the handbook a lot. Did yes. you develop that internally yourself, or yep. is that something that's public? Or? Yeah, so we, we built it internally um, for a couple of reasons. First of all, our process changes quite a lot, uh, and so it's really useful to have a one you know, single source of truth. Um, we have facilitators spread around the globe, and so it's quite hard to get all of us in a call at the same time in order to coordinate those changes. So by having a single artifact that we can change, and then like that is the process that we follow, um, helps us a lot. But yeah, we're always changing the handbook as well. So, you know, we'll add new question prompts. We'll slightly tweak the language when we have to. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. And there was one at the back. Yeah. Hey, thanks for the talk. Really interesting. Um, Thank you. The question I had was around, um, you said when you call that meeting, you get the right people in the room. I was wondering what you used to judge the right people for that meeting. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, primarily, it's about getting a good mix of roles. So the, personally, the thing that I care about most is that we don't fill it up with back-end engineers, right? Or all front-end engineers, or all SRE people. 
Um, I think you'd be surprised at how much additional value you get from people in non-traditional like traditional engineering roles. So having a member from our support team in our post-mortems is hugely valuable. Like it, it, it makes a huge difference. Um, so I think having that diversity of, of sort of perspective on your product is the most important thing. Um, and then beyond that, you know, maybe getting people who haven't been part of the process before, getting a mix of experienced uh, employees and relatively new employees, um, just trying to make sure that you're not getting the same group of people in the room over and over and over again, and you're getting a bit of diversity of thought. I think we're out of time for questions. Sorry. Come talk to me in the hallway. Thank you. So can we get another thank you?